Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 86 of the podcast. It's the 23rd of August, 2017, as I record this intro. And this week, we have two guests. This episode came about because I've had a few listeners suggest the topic of unschooling an only child, but since I have three kids, I don't have much experience to share on this particular topic, so I thought it would be fun to have two guests on. So Deb Rossing and Pat Robinson are two lovely unschooling moms that I've known online for many years and have also met in person at various unschooling conferences. I'm really excited that they both agreed to chat with me. Uh, This week, I've been having a lot of fun working with another unschooling mom who is doing some illustrations for the Unschooling Journey book. I just love the spirit that she's bringing to the work, and I think it'll be a wonderful addition to the text. In the last couple of days, I've been working on where exactly to place them in the book, and the way they weave together is becoming more clear and more beautiful. It's really great stuff. And this week, we had fun with the eclipse. Here in the Toronto area, we had a partial eclipse, 70-something percent, and we had fun wandering in and out of the house to take a look. Uh, We had a few pairs of eclipse glasses, and lucky for us, the weather cooperated. And apparently, in 2024, we're going to be right at the edge of totality, 99%. So that's definitely something fun to look forward to. And I'd like to say thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And a big welcome to new patrons, Julia DiGiorgio, Jagoda Hoffman, and Rebecca Severin. Thanks so much for joining us. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. You guys inspire me. And I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. If you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote comes from Pat Robinson. I don't think it's better with an only child. It's just different than having siblings. I love the point that it's just different. I think sometimes it can be tempting to see some of the challenges a child may be having and, quote, blame the fact that they're an only child. But really, I think more often it's about the individual child. Every child is an individual person with their own strengths and challenges and aspirations. And as unschooling parents, we help them meet their needs and pursue their goals. That is something we do independent of whether or not they have siblings. In the episode, Pat talks about the time and effort she put into creating community and social situations that worked for her son, and Deb shares some too. I have three kids, and I did it too. Having siblings does not mean built-in playmates that share the same interests. I think in the call, you'll hear how similar our roles as unschooling parents of only children and multiple children turned out to be. What kinds of environments are they seeking out? We help them find them. Do they lean to introversion or extroversion? What are their interests? What do they love to do? I think our children's individuality is much more at play in how we support and engage with them than whether or not they have siblings. One isn't better than the other. They are just different. It's a really interesting discussion, so let's get to it. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Deb Rossing and Pat Robinson. Welcome guys. Hi. Hello. (laughs) Deb and Pat are two lovely unschooling moms that I've known online for many years and have also met in person at unschooling conferences and gatherings. 
Now, this episode came about because I've had a few listeners suggest the topic of unschooling an only child a few times, but since I have three kids, I don't have much experience to share on this particular topic, so I am really excited that they both agreed to chat with me about it. So my role here is really going to be the curious question asker this week. (laughs) So to get us started, can you each share with us a bit about you and your family and how you discovered unschooling? And how about you start, Beth? Okay. Uh, Well, first off, our situation is a little bit different in that I work outside the home full time. I've done that since Joshua was a toddler. He's now 19. Can you believe it? (laughs) Um, My husband, who has been the at-home parent since Joshua was a toddler, he was podcast number 10, by the way. Um, And so my take is a little bit different because I haven't been the at home all the time parent um but it's been interesting seeing how that all worked out Mm -hmm. but back um joshua was still a bump in my tummy and um my mother-in-law needed some information on homeschooling laws here in connecticut where we live and so rick and i did some researching and found homeschooling in connecticut is really simple and then we found this unschooling message board back even before Yahoo groups. Um, And so I was telling him about it and we would start throwing questions back and forth. And basically we said, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And so that's, so that's where we started from is the get go basically. Very sweet. How about you, Pat? Well, we never, didn't unschool our we attachment parented friend of mine in the neighborhood was attachment parenting gave me the baby book by dr sears and um mothering magazines and i read those and did the bradley birth and home birth stuff and the attachment parenting just kind of evolved into unschooling and that we just i just delighted in watching our son learn and observe and the continuum concept was uh, a book that I read that really spoke to me about the child having an innate desire to learn and to just watch and around six months old um, I met Anna Brown we're best friends we live about a mile from each other and we have journeyed together watching our children grow her children are a couple years older than mine and we just watched and we saw them learn and and it's so we've just always unschooled um it wasn't a separate thing that we did from living and listening to him and his desires there was a family that first introduced me to the idea of homeschooling i didn't know it was even a possibility we were at a park day she had an eight and ten year old boy and they were curious and assertive and questioning and confident and they we went on this park hike up into the woods and it was like magical he was only like I don't know 15 months old then and all the children there were like a dozen children of all different ages and they were all learning together in this natural environment in this creek the boys the older kids wanted to make a dam and they were involving the little kids to um get me this kind of rock, no, that kind of rock, and bring it over here. And everybody was collaborating and, and working together to, to make this project work. And it was just brought tears to my eyes because I thought, oh, my gosh, this is what that learning is supposed to look like in, in the real world. <laughs> and it was, just, it was just like, that's what I want to do. And she was doing it, and she had a six-month-old also. And I was like, tell me more about this homeschooling idea. And so we just, I just wanted to be with him and and watch him learn. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean. It really was magical. Yeah, I got goosebumps just listening because, you know, I was, my kids, my eldest, I guess, was nine, really, before I had even heard. Like you said, you'd never heard of homeschooling before. I had never either. Um, so that, that sounds like a beautiful way to, to kind of be introduced to it. <laughs> and you came across a dev doing some research for someone yeah. else. Isn't that cool? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, cause, <laughs> my, cause 
Rick has three sisters, two of them were still around nine, ten years old when we got married. Mm -hmm. And so by the time Joshua was coming along, they were in like the high school ages and having some issues at school. And his mom was just at the, at the end of a rope trying to figure out what to do because the school wasn't helping. Um, so we did some research and found out she could just pull him from school and that was it. <laughs> so then we were like, hmm, that sounds like a really interesting idea. And it took, it, it just made sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so, I mean, it sounds like with both of you, you know, your move to unschooling was really just to continue living because you guys got familiar with the concepts, um, you know, before your, your children were actually school age. Is that true? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple other things that were interesting to me were that, well, my husband was valedictorian of his class and he is left brain and he'd always excelled in school and I had always done well in school, but I was right brained and I was always curious and wanting more information and how was that related to that and what happened before that. And I just was told we're not covering that right now and that's not on the test and that's not what we're talking about today. And I just remember that experience of not being able to learn and explore information as my interest was telling me, oh, there's more to this story. And so um, we love school, my husband and I did, but it was just like my sister had finished sixth grade math in fourth grade, but when we moved to a different state, they wouldn't give her seventh grade math. They, she had to do fifth grade math all over again for a year, then sixth grade math all over again for a year. And my parents fought the Board of Education and went to the Board of Education and went to the school to try to get accommodations. And they just wouldn't make accommodations. And I just thought, whew, we're going to have that kind of struggle. I don't need it to be that way. And mm -hmm. when I heard you could homeschool at your child's own pace and, and just allow your child to learn as fast as they want about something and whatever it is that they're interested in and explore it together, that just made more sense to me. And it sounded easier than fighting the school system. <laughs> yeah, actually, we're, we're kind of the flip from you guys, Pat, because I'm the left brain. I'm, I'm a very left brain oh. person. <laughs> um, but Rick is very much the creative, curious, wants to know other things. And he did really well in areas of school that he was interested in and basically mm -hmm. ignored everything else. <laughs> So it was it was a bit of a struggle for him to get through just because he didn't see any point in a lot of it. Well, I also found that the stories that the school te teaches you about yourself and your abilities isn't necessarily correct. I mm -hmm. was told that I wasn't doing well at history because I wasn't just memorizing and memorizing isn't my forte, but the mm -hmm. story and what happened in all the what led up to things, that part of history, I was fascinated by, but that wasn't what we were taught by this uh -huh. elder teacher who wanted us to memorize things. And so I knew there were two different ways of learning. And then like with math, my sister excelled at math and I felt like, well, I wasn't good at math by comparison. And, but it was that whole thing of comparing us to other people. When, mm -hmm. when I went to college, I was really good at math and I didn't know it all those years because <laughs> I had been told, you know, good at math means you do it easily or like without effort, like my sister. And so it, it, they just tell you things and you, you believe it in school and a child doesn't need to be told these things are limitations of their ability to learn or things they have to focus on because they're not good at it. We just didn't do it that way. Yeah, that's, it's, it, my sister always thought she was bad at math. But that's because she's very right-brained and thinks visually. Mm -hmm. The story so, problems I could do. <laughs> well, her, her thing was the story problems only worked once she could figure out how to make a picture from it. Mm -hmm. But you can't write on the paper. You had to show your work. And like, yeah. it's like I it's, just yeah, exactly. figured it out. Like, and like you would get points deducted for just figuring it out. Like that didn't make sense to me. None of that kind of regimen made sense to me as a right brain yep. person. Yeah. Isn't it so cool how um, valuable it is to process um, all our, our own personal school experiences? Because we can get to the same things from such different, you know, I can from a really good school experience, 
but when I, you know, dig into it and think about what, what was good and, 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 and seeing the, the effects of that good in my sense, as in, you know, marks, you know, because that's the mm-hmm. only that's the only way you judge good and bad at school. I'm really right? good at taking tests. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. <laughs> exactly. Really good at taking so, tests. Yeah. It's you a know. skill set. Yeah. And but, some people but are better at taking tests, but that's it, not really a life skill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you can, whether or not you you did well at it or you didn't, um, thinking through it still uh, makes sense and helps you understand why. Unschooling um, is such a more hmm, natural way to learn. Maybe that's the way. It's to how it. we learn now. Yeah, just like yeah. people are learning about unschooling. They find mentors. They ask questions. They read. They find resources, and that's how we learn every day about whatever it is We're any of us have in. interest in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. that that's easier on with fewer students in the classroom. I, I understand the math education is structured for a different purpose because you have so many people and you can't have them all asking questions at the same time. But one of the luxuries of having an only child is it's just like one-on-one tutoring <laughs> in, in that you're just responsive to their questions and whatever they're asked, we can explore. And, whatever, and, I, and if I don't know, I don't know. I, we find out. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> well, and I mean, that's, that's a, the thing about you, that. Uh, that's why I call it, you know, the education system, because that's the priority, right? The priority is the system. Be- the priority is getting mass numbers through it, right? Mm-hmm. So, and managing those numbers. I mean, that, that is the priority over, over it and above the learning, right? Mm-hmm. Well, um, if you have 30 or 20 mm-hmm. students to get through to the next grade and which ones can and can't proceed, you have to have a structure to that yeah. to make it manageable. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in that mean context, the best way it makes for them sense. To learn. Yeah. And it certainly isn't the best way for right brain people. In my yeah, opinion. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, next question here. Um, because we are talking about only children, let's dive into that a little bit more deeply. Uh, since an only child spends their home time hanging out with adults, of course, I was wondering if you guys worried about them having the opportunity to socialize with other kids. Was that something that you worried about regularly? And if so, did you do anything in particular to address that? Do you want to start, Deb? Sure. Well, the short answer is, did I worry about it? No. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, did we... Did we find opportunities to, to hang out with people of all ages? Oh, yeah. We, we were hanging. When Joshua was, was younger, he was maybe five or six, one of, his, one of the people he called my friend was an elderly African-American wheelchair-bound lady at church. Mm-hmm. And every week he would say, is my friend going to be there? And when she mm-hmm. arrived, he would go sit next to her. Sometimes he would chat away about whatever he was doing. Sometimes the two of them just sat there next to each other being companionable. And, you know, other times he was running around with the other kids. He loved the teenage girls when he was little. It was his favorite thing was to hang out with the teenage girls. Mm-hmm. He was a flirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing he never quite could get were kids his exact same age. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing was, most of them, unless we were at like an unschooling conference or something, most of the kids his age had a school playground mindset of pecking orders and pushing boundaries and, you know, trying to get around the rules and that kind of thing. And he didn't think there was any need to get around the rules. If he didn't like the rules, he'd leave. (laughs) You know, that was, that was his thing, was if he, if he was there, it was because he agreed that the rules made sense, and if he, they didn't make sense, he would not go there. Um, so pushing the boundaries and, and doing that, you know, who's got what things or who's better at this or that, that was not a thing for him. And so older kids were great, younger kids were great, kids his age confused him. How about you, Pat? We've had so many varied experiences around the idea of play dates and friends. I 
can remember going to a 4th of July fireworks. And Eric just thought, thinks everybody's a friend he hasn't met yet. And he would he was telling the little boy, okay, our phone number is 704. <laughs> you need to come to our house. And, and like, he's like four or five years old. And I'm like, well, we're like in the middle of Charlotte and it's, they're, we don't know where they live. <laughs> we live really far south. <laughs> and, um, they, he can come and play because our, we have a huge homeschooling community in Charlotte. We have like 22,000 homeschoolers in the region. And so there are a lot of resources for classes, co-ops, mm -hmm. discounts at um, businesses. There are lots of opportunities. And in our home, we had invited on a homeschool loop for people to come, you know, this age range, this is what we have a play set in a yard and some video games. And we would have 20 families every week come. So he just thinks, come, anybody can just come to our house. Just, just tell them. To come. <laughs> and so <laughs> he did. He just told everybody to come, even if we just met them and he liked them. So it's not been an issue in that regard. We also created opportunities um, when we kind of outgrew our house and going to the park and wrecking. I um, called around, called around, called around, trying to find different places that would provide resources for us to have like a game day or a video game day or a board game day or a um, photography club or a chess club or all these different things that kids can have interest in and be exposed to or explore or try out without having to join something. And so we found um, a park and rec facility that allowed us to come weekly. And so we had probably a hundred families that would come each week on a varied schedule as their schedule would allow. And so we had a whole bunch of interest-based activities. Now, along the way, the other thing that has been a learning process for me is that, and Anna's helped me, she, she swears since he was very young, that um, your son is an introvert and I'm going to protect him from your extroverted way. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd be like, let's have a hundred people over every day. And then Eric would be amped up and like, he wanted it. He liked it for an hour and a half. Yeah. He liked it so that we could leave when he was overstimulated and overwhelmed as a young child, or he didn't want to sit in a class where the teachers were making him do things like we never did that kind of thing. So we just needed to pick and choose and create what worked for us. And so we would just create opportunities around his interests, like video game day or a Mario Kart day at our house, but it would be for a limited amount of time. So the introvert was done long before mom was done socializing. <laughs> so I needed to find ways to meet my social needs outside of his play dates, which is a thing that I consistently see is an issue for some families where there's an extroverted mom and introverted children. And it worked out for us that Eric, when we would go come home from those activities, he wanted his alone time. And I think it must be harder for a child uh, who's extroverted and an introverted parent and harder for the parent um, to meet maybe those, the child's extroverted needs. And, but there are tons and tons of opportunities for classes. Um, we just made them interest based. I think that's a great point. And, and I love uh, when you talked about calling around and around, you know, to find these places, because I mean, that is something um, that, that I've had to do that I find a lot of people are doing. Um, it, it's easy to just say, oh, we don't have it. We don't have it. But, you know, if you think a little bit creatively, you can and, and you just keep pursuing it, keep trying, like even even for interests. You know, I remember when Michael started karate, you know, maybe that dojo isn't isn't going to be the right atmosphere, but there's more not to worry about. Oh, you know, there's only one close to us. Sometimes you're, we're driving when we moved um, for the first year, I would drive Lissy back an hour to go to uh, her girl guide group once a week because mm -hmm. that was something that was important to her and her socializing, you know, that the, that was a group that she was comfortable with, kids that she knew, and, you know, it was important to her to be able to do that as well. You know, so it, it's so worth making the um, extra effort 
to uh, create these situations that work for our child. Like you were saying, you know, maybe putting a, uh, a time on it because, you know, he only needs a couple of hours or driving 45 minutes an hour because that's a situation that they enjoy. There's so many um, unique and fun and creative ways that we can meet their social um needs i guess because yeah, it, it is really personal isn't it totally personal to the child i i have one that's super introverted and you know it, it's it's really really um um different and it really i i found anyway that that it, it just takes time to get to know them really well and it takes that determination to keep looking and not you know get discouraged you don't have to it's not something that needs to be solved immediately Right. Like you were saying, Deb, you know, the places that you guys went, he found and connected with some people. And he he discovered that the age ranges, the ones that that he got along with uh, better, that he enjoyed their mm -hmm. company more. And I, I found that, too, that, you know, for quite a while, you know, it was the older ones or the younger ones, uh, because at that point, that age budding isn't an issue anymore. Right. Yeah, he was actually, he was, um, for a while, he was what I would call the goat, the goat. where all the, all the littler kids like to chase him because ah. he was a bear. And so they would chase him around and around and around. And then their parents mm -hmm. would signal to him over their heads that it's time to go. And he would run pat, he would run around and then run past the parents and they'd scoop up the little kids and they were done. <laughs> so he, they, and they, they, the little ones never really caught on that, hey, this is what's happening. They just enjoyed chasing him and he would take his big long legs and run really slow. So they kind of almost catch him. Um, but yeah, it was, it's, it's been interesting finding that balance because we found when he was younger, he could be extroverted three times a week. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the times, no, <laughs> mm -hmm. he's not going anywhere or it's going to be ugly. Um, and so finally, yeah, we found it changed over time too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was more pronounced when he was younger as he got older, because when he, when he was younger, we helped him deal with situations where you've got to go for, to this fourth thing because it's the, a set appointment for something you know you can't opt out of it but we can help you make it easier and mm -hmm. so as he got older he learned to take those tools and apply them himself so he he knew okay we're doing a fourth thing this week um, mom can you make sure that we have this snack on hand or I need to bring my headphones when we go to this thing or whatever um, and so it, as he's gotten older, he's been able to apply those himself and deal with situations that he might not have been able to do when he was four, five, six years old. So you didn't find, um, you know, I think that's one thing that, that I, I hear uh, pretty regularly is just the worry that they're getting less social experience. But really what I'm hearing from you guys is it's really just up to the child, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. How mm -hmm. much, how much social experience they're looking for. And, and uh, you, you find creative ways to meet it. There's not like, there's not like a line that um, every child should have, you know what I mean? Because yeah. because when they're engaging in a social experience because they're choosing it, they're learning so much there. But if if um, they're they're not choosing it, like if they're overwhelmed or whatever, they're not gaining. Um, well, what they're gaining is is experience with the tools on how to manage that overwhelm, really, right? <laughs> and that and that's where we come in and helping them to manage it. Yeah. But also, I think it's a even if it's only, you know, twice a week or three times a week or whatever, it's a more varied experience than the same people in the same room doing the same thing every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. you know, there's we found up until about age 10, it didn't matter so much who the playmates were. So we could go to a variety of parks. We could go to um, if different events or activities um like a snake day at the museum or whatever or go to the museum where there are other kids playing and it was more just exploring and curious 
after probably around age 10, the interest was more specific with more specificity. Mm -hmm. And he, it didn't matter what age the participants were, like you were saying, like if they were older, then he learned from them. If they were younger, then he, he was the leader guy. And yeah. so he got different social skills um, from those varied ages. And because in that interest-based thing, he was getting more depth and breadth of information. I remember at Pokemon years ago, the sensory overload because of the high ceiling and the loud voices and everybody laughing. And I thought, he loves Pokemon, but this is going to not work because it's just so loud. But there was an older teen who took the time, who sat there and taught, taught him how to play. He was completely absorbed in it, and he was able to accomplish that in a manner that was comfortable to him, and he's loved Pokemon ever since. But if I had said, you need to go to this environment of something that you're not interested in with all this sensory overwhelm, there's nothing that he would have learned from mm -hmm. it, <laughs> okay. other than frustration, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. And then now, with his interest still in different areas, a lot of the people with the same interests are much older than he is by 5, 10, 15 years. And um, they are teaching him other life skills of patience and strategic thinking and, and like just being calm in their reactions with disappointment, even within competition and such. So there's different skills or from different people at different ages. You know, it just occurred to me, to, is thinking it, it, like, you know how we talk about, you know, um, the point is not learning to read, but you will pick up that skill as you pursue um, right, your interest. Right, that's priority. Yeah, same with, like, social skills. You know, the the goal isn't social skills. The goal is no. to be in the world so the way you want to be in the world, and you'll pick those up along the way, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, that makes sense. Even now, we drive an hour two to three times a week to get to the north side because he has very specific friends that he wants to see doing lots of different things that he wouldn't choose to do with just people that he doesn't know. But he's exploring different things than he might because his friends are there. Mm -hmm. And so there's no agenda that he explore new things or that he meet more people or that he learn to do this task at any certain time. In the reading, he just learned, he's 16 now, but he, he just learned that from um, the DVR, actually. So. Yeah, I, I think um, I, that might be a, another piece, too, for, for people. Um, because traveling and taking my kids like distances for the things that they were interested in um, has never been a big deal. That's that's just been what I choose to do. I remember when we moved rurally, um, some of the the other parents would say to me, "Well, you know, when because they were a ten and under, uh, well, a little bit, maybe twelve and under. Yeah, you know, when they're teens, they're gonna want to hang out with people and they're gonna be mad that you live rurally." I'm like, oh, well, well, we'll see what happens. But I, I never expected it, and it didn't come to pass because I wasn't trying to stop them. I was trying to help them do the things they wanted to do. And if it mm -hmm. meant driving into the city, then we drove into the city. I, I wasn't going to take that on and think, oh, man, they're making me drive them places and feel put upon. No, because I was choosing to help them explore the world and, and dive into their interests and do all those kinds of things. So you know, we, it was something I happily chose to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Of course, that's, that's one, yeah. that's one upside of, of having just one, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> if you keep going in six different directions. We've got one who maybe gets, you know, a few things going at a time, but it's just one. Mm -hmm. And so there, it, it's a lot easier on the gas mileage. <laughs> Yeah, and then a, a few times trying to juggle getting, you know, two people, two kids uh, to different places on the same evening. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I would I would uh, drive Lissy to some dance classes, then go drop off Mike, and then then I would pick up one and be like, okay, we need to hurry because we have to go get the other one. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, uh, I guess we should probably move on to the next question. Um, at home with an only child, uh, you are in essence at that time when you guys are home, your child's only playmate. Um, so I was wondering if there were, you know, did, did that feel like a restriction or a pressure or a weight on you as their only playmate? Um, were there times when you, when they wanted to play something or do something that you didn't enjoy? And if so, how did you handle those moments? Uh, would you like to start, Pat? I think a lot of it is if somebody is wanting to play, they're wanting connection. And so I would meet the need for connection in ways that were mutually satisfying as opposed to doing Barbies or dress up or trains at, at nauseam. That's not really, I didn't consider myself a playmate. I would facilitate. So if he mm -hmm. wanted a train thing, I wouldn't do choo-choo sounds or whatever, but I would set up this most elaborate train system with bridges and, you know, um, tunnels and things like that. Or I would sit and watch shows with him and that he was specifically interested in. And we would draw or do cutouts or things that were more intellectually facilitatory as opposed to playing at the same level of, of a six-year-old. I provided other opportunities for other children to do that by inviting them into our home, going to other people's house, meeting at parks and such, having video game days here, because I can't play video games. He'll tell you, like, mom can't do video games. <laughs> and so I can research when the next one's coming out and make sure we're at the GameStop to get the free download. I can make sure that we get there, but I can't find the A button. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm there with you there. <laughs> but we would do things that I love too. That um, so he learned how to garden when he was three, four, five years old. Like he knew trees because we were out in the woods, and he knew flower identification. He we would go places. We traveled. We go to animal things where there are things where we would be exploring. We went to the museums and all kinds of nature things so that they, we were doing things or exploring things, watching them on TV when we're at home, providing things for him musically that he could explore at home. But I wasn't, I didn't do Barbies. And <laughs> <laughs> what was your experience, Deb? Well, as I said in the beginning, it's a little bit different because I was mm -hmm. gone from 7.30 to 5.30, Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. So the times I had when I could play with him, it was a really small window a lot of times. And so that was really important for connecting. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't play video games. <laughs> yeah, he, started, he started playing when he was five. I actually get motion sickness watching a lot Me too. that he does. Um, but I could make sure that he was at, you know, Toys R Us to get the legendary Pokemon. And I remembered to plug in his, his Game Boy the night before so it would be fully charged. Yes. Um, but the, the flip side of that, though, was, was that he learned that sometimes he really wanted me to play you know, these particular video games that were really important to him at the time. But he also knew that mommy gets really uncomfortable playing those games. So what he would do is find the most open scenario, you know, a big open field instead of stairs and turns and buildings and stuff. So mm -hmm. I couldn't bump into any walls. <laughs> it would just be a big open field. And he would set the in-game timer for the, the match to be like 10 or 15 minutes as, as small as possible because I could hold it together for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and it was just enough that we could share that experience with that, without me being really uncomfortable or him getting frustrated. Um, you know, there were times when he wanted me to sit on the floor and play things. I'm not a sit on the floor and play things person. You, you'd need a crane to get me off the floor. Um, but 
I could sit on the couch and say, okay, move your, move my blue character to use this ability attacking your yellow character. And he would move them and make sound effects and whatever. And then he would do something. And so I could verbalize it and let him do the figuring out the physical part of it. And we could still interact around that particular thing, those particular characters. Um, so, you know, it was, it was important to, to clarify that these, you know, these set the expectations. Yes, I can do this for 15 minutes. I can't do it for 20 minutes. We'll have to find something else if you want to go further. Um, and so that was really important. It's important in business even. You know, you set the expectations for your customers. And setting the expectations of what I can do and what I can't do was really important. Yeah, I think that's just that's just sharing um, our, ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. and our um, our strengths, our weaknesses, the things that are hard for us, etc. And and those are just kind of the constraints that come in when we're brainstorming things that will meet everybody's needs. Those are just our needs that we're expressing, right? So yeah, can how about we play this? It'll only take like 15 minutes because I know you you don't feel well after or whatever or setting up that uh, that being in a in an open spot so you're not running around through uh, <laughs> through enclosed areas in the game. You know that's all just that level of trust in the relationship that we're not trying to get out of something. Right. Yeah. They know by saying, right. I can't do it. They're not trying to get we're not trying to get out. We're not trying to um, get away from them. But we still can work together and find a way that we can all comfortably move forward. Right. Yeah, I think that that's a, an important thing is it's not an automatic. No, mm -hmm. I can't do that. It's a this level of thing I, is, is hard for me. It hurts my knees. It hurts my eyes. It, you know, whatever. Um, but I can do this level of thing. And then we can do something else. Um, it, it's not, a, it's not a, just an automatic, no, you go play by yourself kind of thing because I can't do that. Yeah. And I could do card games and I learned Pokemon and I had a really great deck. And I, I would help the kids and I'd be tutoring them and saying, well, you sure you want to do this and sure you want to do that and, 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 and learning with him and our other kids, I mean, I, to explore with depth his interest mm -hmm. in a manner that is comfortable for me. It's not moving. It's not jumping. It's not disappeared somewhere into the video game space where you're supposed to find it. It's a card sitting in front of me. Like I could do the card game. Mm -hmm. And so that is something I was able to do with a lot of time, energy, and interest. And so that was another way we could connect, even though it wasn't video games of that thing. That, that actually, the one thing that was really interesting is I could handle, when, when he moved up in video games, I inherited his little Game Boy. Mm -hmm. And I actually beat Pokemon Sapphire. Woo! Woo! Yay! Me. <laughs> but um, the interesting part of it was, though, he became the leader because he knew how to get through the game. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. instead of me oh, saying... Oh, yeah. So there's a teacher. He, he, be, he became more... He was more experienced than I was at this particular thing. So I might be able to, you know, help him play chess, but... I couldn't find this Pokemon I needed to get. And how do I beat this particular, you know, gym or whatever? And so it was a it was a role reversal that I think was really helpful in seeing. I mean, we, we do that naturally all the time yeah. with people. Sometimes we're the learner and sometimes we're the more experienced person. And sometimes so it's, it, not just, it's, just, it's just interesting when the, the, the person who is the more experienced person is six. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that happens that, all the time here. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but I think um, I think conventionally that might not, right? Because uh, parents mm -hmm. either either they won't uh, they don't respect their child's interests enough to want to learn mm -hmm. about it. Something that their child knows more or is more experienced with, so that um, you can learn from them. You know, I think that that's a huge piece. And and I think that is a great step to make um, 
the, the focus is on the learning. It's not on who's older. It's, it's on who knows what. And let's share this piece of knowledge. Like, like you were talking about just sharing what our interests are, you know, Eric mm -hmm. hanging out in the garden with you, right? Pat? Mm -hmm. And, and it's how, the connecting and the collaborating. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to do with, um, you know, an adult or a child. It has to do with interests, connection, uh, just hanging out together and, and getting to know one another, right? That's another. I got, I got to ask Pat, what was, mm -hmm. what kind of deck did you have? What did you build? Was I had a psychic water deck. Oh, okay. Yeah, we we might have had fun water. because I preferred fire and electric. I know. Well, and Scott learned too, and like my husband, and um, we 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 uh, we created games where we could do all three together, and like, <laughs> we were all my Scott and I and my sister were all in state tournaments in North and South Carolina for Pokemon card game, trading card games, Yay. and um, with Eric, and um, it's it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> We love well, the Pokemon I'll, family. I, I'm going to go with Anna here and say I was more of an Animal Crossing person. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I never got there. Uh, okay, uh, next question. As parents of an only child, uh, you are the person uh, at home that they come to for engagement. So um, I think we touched on this before, to share their thoughts, to play games, just to express their emotions. You know, you're the, the, the other person there to connect with all the time. Um, and I can imagine that sometimes that might feel overwhelming. So I was wondering if you could share some of the ways um, that you found to keep yourself refreshed and energized. Pat, you were talking about this a little bit earlier about, you know, knowing you're being extroverted and finding different ways to get that need met while still meeting his more introvert needs. So uh, what did you find in that area, Deb? Um, well, again, we, we, we kind of have a tag team situation. Yeah. Um, you know, I would tag in as soon as I got home from work. Mm -hmm. And so while Rick was making dinner, we would transition to me finding out about Joshua's day and start connect, connecting back up again. Um, and so a lot of times it was not so much me feeling overwhelmed because I hadn't been there all day, but it was more about me taking some of that off of the Rick who was at home all day. So I would do things like, you know, it was refreshing for me to have a date night with Joshua. Mm -hmm. You know, we would take, we would go to Starbucks and play Battleship or Cribbage or whatever um, for an hour or so. Rick would have a quiet house to himself. So he would be refreshed and I would reconnect with my boy, um, which was refreshing for me. Um, so it was kind of a tag team partnership kind of thing of who needed what at that point. There were some days where we had been out all day and I'd say, look guys, I need to go take a nap because I'm just socialed out. And they knew that that's what I needed. You know, it was, it became a, a habit that mother's day, I got a big bubble bath, you know, <laughs> Joshua would pick what flavor it would be and Rick would run the tub and I'd sit there until the water got cold. Um, <laughs> you know, currently it's, it's my tea time. I have a whole collection of teas and a kettle and, and I just sit and have tea and they know when I'm sitting there with a book and a cup of tea, I kind of need to chill. Um, but I think another thing too, is that because we have a partnership kind of thing where it's tag team, that's a lot easier in some ways than some of the, the, the moms I know who are at home with their kids and their husband or partner is not on board as much and so they don't get that respite for some of the time. Mm -hmm. What did you find, Pat? Well, I've had some healthy and unhealthy ways. I think the unhealthy, because I think self-care is really important and so what I would find for meeting my um, social needs, I would stay up really late online and, and not get enough sleep. So that was not healthy for me. It really, I feel like stress my adrenals when I started taking care of myself better and going to bed at 10 o'clock and feeling more refreshed, then I, I just felt better than 
even getting my social extroverted needs met at one and two o'clock when the house was quiet. Instead, I, we created um, Daddy Day on Saturday. Uh, I started getting a massage occasionally, and um, that was that was that that was a, just a piece of wonderfulness <laughs> <laughs> to go and know you were off for like sixty minutes. It was wonderful. <laughs> Anna and I would go to the grocery store together. We had grocery store dates so that. Um, I would be getting to see her and we'd be like, oh, have you seen this thing at this aisle, aisle four or whatever and learn about different organic foods or whatever. Um, we, I started mom's night out once a month. Um, and then the daddy day on Saturday became, a, a, Anna and I would go to lunch on Saturday and they would go out to lunch. And then it grew to, they went up to the train museum, which was an hour away. And so I got like half a day off. and. Um, then it became Carowinds over time, and so they would go for to Carowinds for the afternoon. And so, as he's grown older, those things, their connecting time grew, because it always was part of their relationship, and that provided me opportunities to have time for myself. But staying up late wasn't the healthiest piece, but it, it in when I was he was very young, it met a need. Yeah, I think that that's all part of us growing and, and learning about ourselves, isn't it, right? And and finding how um, the things that refresh us and gaining experience to see if, you know, in the longer term, maybe they don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I mean, trying to think of, uh, you know, a, a few things around here, it was... It, the the other thing I would do too um, would be to like you were talking about earlier the the things that um, I enjoy doing as well you know if if they want to do something and I'd say you know I don't have the energy for that right now but you know I I'd love to play a board game or I'd love to uh, watch a movie or something you know it was always mm -hmm. just about being upfront you know sharing what we were feeling when we were hitting a wall you know it really uh talking about those times and not shying away from them and not not i was i didn't say not hiding them but not um martyrly showing them off either you know what i mean it yeah. just being honest and open mm -hmm. and, and because then we're not marginalizing our own feelings yeah exactly not marginalizing our own feelings but not putting them on the child, just saying, this is what I need. I need 10 minutes for a cup of tea, and then we can do that for a half an hour. And then I got to do dinner or, you know, like just talking. Yeah, about yeah. that's a like, great I one. have needs, you have needs. And Eric, since I, I can't remember, age four maybe, he's been a master negotiator. Okay, mom, but what if you have the tea now and then you do a half an hour? Okay. That sounds like that'll work. That meets my need. That meets your need. He would be the one that's making suggestions too. Mm -hmm. He's always been able to take in the other people's preferences and say, hmm, I still want to get my need met. Okay, what about this and this and this? And it meets everybody's need. So he's a negotiator. The skill that they pick up. Um, I mean, by the time my kids, my kids were so good at that as well. And, and I would, when I got stuck someplace and couldn't figure out a way through it, I would go and ask them, even if they weren't involved, <laughs> you know, I'd say, well, you know, I want to well, really want to do this and this, but this is happening. How do you think I can work that out? And they would have great ideas. Uh, it depends on your assumptions too, because some people assume the child's manipulating and trying to get their way or. And it's like, they are trying to get their way. I want him to get his way. He wants me to get my way too. We both are working together for both of us to get our way. It's not that he's manipulating me to get his way by saying, well, I'll do this if you do that. But it's not like that. It's like, he wants me to get what I need and I want him to get what he needs. And so we're, we're brainstorming together to do that. Such a great point. And, and when you're open and honest with your needs, that's, that's how um, we can come up with a plan to meet them where nobody feels slighted, right? So everybody knows that we're all working together. You know, nobody's got an alter. And sometimes the need, sometimes the need is delayed in gratification in that 
okay, you're really wanting to get the Pokemon thing, but we have to get this thing done today, or this needs to be done, and this needs to be done, but let's do it after this or tomorrow, first thing. Mm -hmm. The need is still important to me, and we're going to get it met, and sometimes my need is the one that's delayed. Mm -hmm. And when you follow through the next day, that's how you build trust. And right, that's you're correct. much more willing next time to wait that day because mm -hmm. they know that, that it will come true, right? I think, too, we're, we're, we're trained to an, an or. Either, mm -hmm. either I get my thing or you get your thing. Yeah. And changing the mindset to and, how can we get mine and yours? Mm -hmm. is is is, a, is a, a, an important change in the mindset because we're trained up to if I get what I want, you don't get what you want and vice versa. You know, so I need to hold on to my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's one of the benefits of being with your child so much as opposed to being in school is that those more adaptive as opposed to maladaptive negotiating or bullying, as it were, <laughs> skills um, aren't being taught. In some homes, I guess they are, but... Yeah, in general. Yeah, I, I mean, that is one thing that that um, that my kids have found going, you know, with their friends and stuff. It's not a skill that a lot of them have, like you said, developed, have a lot of experience at negotiating. You know, they'll, they'll be standing around in a crowd and, and it'll be, you know, we want to do this. No, we want to do this. And it's like, who can shout the loudest, you know, rather than taking mm -hmm. five minutes to figure out a way that, you know, we can reasonably meet both of them, you know, so my kids have kind of taken on that role sometimes too. No, that's interesting. Okay, last question here. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to say. At this point, what has been the most surprising thing about your unschooling journey? And let's start with Pat. that I am learning all the time. <laughs> I'm fascinated at the things he's teaching me, the things that he learns through some osmosis of the world that I know that I haven't exposed him to. And it's like, how do you know that? And he'll ask questions that they say they'll never ask. Mom, what's an adverb? What's a participle? I'm like, okay. <laughs> This is just a funny sentence that people are not saying. It will never happen. And I find that amusing. Um, we've traveled a lot, and it's just his curiosity has been constant. It's not that I've had to point things out or tell him to learn things. It's just always been easy. He just is curious. He's never been thwarted from learning. He's been facilitated, so whatever he's interested in, we try to find a way to learn more information about it. If I don't know, we find books, videos, documentaries, research it on the internet. It's just, he has those skills too. Now, I mean, you know, since 12 or something, where he just researches things himself. And so he just, for having been, one would, you know, in a homeschooling environment, he knows so much about foreign politics, world issues, ge um, countries, con you know, um, constitutions of different countries, history of wars and things, things that are world topics because of his interest in learning as opposed to we're going to be tested on this and you need to know the dates. So I, I've just found the joy of it. That's awesome. What about you, Deb? Um, I've actually been thinking about this question a bit for the last day or so since you sent them. Um, and I think the most surprising thing is how much I just really enjoy Joshua's company as an adult in the household. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was fun when he was a kid and we were exploring things and, you know, we'd find out all sorts of odd and interesting tidbits, like why soccer is called soccer, you know, and, and but some people call it football, you know, all those kind of fun things, where words came from. Um, but I've got a 19-year-old who voluntarily goes grocery shopping with his old mom. <laughs> and we have fun doing it. And I think that is just 
that's just amazing that we can have these kind of family in jokes and just have fun together as not as parent child specifically, but he's just a, a fun person to be around. And I think that's just that it's, and I'm not really surprised by it so much as I'm really enjoying this, that it's, it's, you know, something that it, you don't always see, mm -hmm. I think in, in the, in the, in the larger society where kids can't wait to get away from their parents as far as possible. He really likes helping me do the grocery shopping because we get some time together and, it, you know, we can talk about stuff in the front seat of the car that's, you know, where you're not looking at the other person, yeah. um, which kind of helps some, th some kind of conversations. Um, but we, we really, in he, he comes up with some things. It's like, how did you know, like, like Pat was saying, how do, how do you know where that, how do you know why they call it soccer? Mm -hmm. And what he does because he picked it up somewhere. Um, and we were having lunch and the question came up and he just threw it out in between the French fries. And it's like, and, and it's like really serious. <laughs> so Rick had to look it up on his cell phone and sure enough, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it can be surprising because it's not something you expect to be an outcome of choosing to not send your kid to school, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that. Oh, well, he can go if he wants. I feel like he, yeah. he's made that decision too. That's, I think that most of us that have done this long term, um, listening yeah. to our child, aren't making the, the decision about going to school or not going to school. But I think that. He's always had the option if he wanted to go to school, but he doesn't want to go to school. He yeah. likes having fun and learning. Okay, well, get, so giving them the option not to go to school. <laughs> yeah. Every, every couple of years we would ask Joshua, so, you know, yeah. school's coming. Are you interested? And he's like, he would think for a minute, nope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was, when he was five, we were, we were coming back from a, um, you know, so he was just barely school age. We were coming back from a park day mid afternoon and I had taken the day off cause it was like a big picnic and the end of school year kind of thing for the homeschooling group. Um, and we're coming back and we got behind a school bus and he got really quiet for a minute and then said, you know, if I went to school, I'd have no time to play or anything. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, he's five and he's figured this out already. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, you know, it was always on the table if he wanted to. There was never anything, you know, I know some kids, you know, they really, really need and want to, you know, do certain things that only some sort of a private or public school is going to provide, you know, um, certain resources. But a lot of times you can find those other ways, but not always, depending on where you live. Um, and so that it always needs to be an option mm -hmm. that they, if they, if this is a resource that they need, that's where you're going because that's what you're choosing at this time for that particular reason. And it's such a different well, And kids can always can try it, it. Mm -hmm. in the yeah. future. It's not like you can't, next year or the next year or the next year mm -hmm. so i mean yeah it's, 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 just, it's it's an option it's there it exists right mm -hmm. i mean i know when when lissy was looking at photography programs and stuff in in local colleges and and all that kind of stuff yeah it's it's always uh an option to consider right it's just it's not um the the only option you know it's not that's what you need to do to get X, Y, Z. There's just, there's always um, possibilities. And, and you just, you, you have conversations about all the different ways that they can be met. And maybe, yeah, that's a, a way they want to try it and meet mm -hmm. their needs. You know, but a lot of kids try it out and, and see, and they get, you know, more experience and decide to come home you know, or not. I think that the huge difference is um, the atmosphere, right? You know, we're not going to um, bring that whole school structured um, authoritarian environment 
home yeah, with you, them, right? You're, so, you're not gonna you're not gonna get a dollar for every A you get on your report card, yeah. kind of, because that's the mentality a lot of people have. Is, yeah. you, know, you know, this is your work, and you will you earn things if you do this, and it, that just doesn't fly. Exactly. It's about the learning. Like, like you were saying, Pat, it's, it's we're learning all the time. And, and even in school, they're going to be, you, you know, they want them to go to school and learn those things for the report card so they can get those A's, right, and reward them for those A's. But they're learning all sorts of other things <laughs> <laughs> about being in the system, aren't they? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, That's, my goodness. I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think that one of the things that being home offers also is the opportunity to learn and to live compassionately mm -hmm. with other people, which has more limited models of that within the school system, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those learning skills are really important. Mm -hmm. Learning consent, learning choices, learning what is uh, best for you as a person, mm -hmm. as opposed to what you have to do because you're told to, because it's time to. Like, uh, I think that self-knowledge is a big benefit of being home together. Yeah, and, well, and the, the and out in the world, <laughs> and the and the the ability to learn how to resolve how to how to negotiate how to resolve things mm -hmm. without needing to necessarily push your point or or be aggressive about it. You know, with you know, you don't have you don't have to you know push somebody off the hill to be king of the hill when maybe both of you can be on top of the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's that's something that I found too. The the self awareness is amazing, you know, and and the understanding that we're always learning and changing. I think that's something mm -hmm. that that they pick up over time too, because because they have the time to think about it and they notice, you know, uh, you know, oh, I really liked that two years ago. I I know sometimes Lucy will say, "Gee, I wonder what my fifteen year old self would say about you know me making this choice now." You know? <laughs> <laughs> understand how we grow and change I think that's awesome and to have the self-awareness to be able to see that progression I think is great and and the point of of like we were talking about earlier right finding uh, a way through we were talking about negotiating or um, you know come just coming up with a way to to un you understand that other people have needs i think that's that's a basic thing that's that's hard is is um to be able to take in other people's needs and not think they're at the expense of yours right and and to be able to well, i think that. with the video games mm -hmm. like deb was saying her experience and perspective of playing video games as mine is is different than our child's perspective they may like the fat or roller coasters or <laughs> Uh -huh. Japanese food or riding a bike like we all have different experiences of it and I think that that's there's a right experience and a wrong experience sometimes in school where you have to do well in every subject mm -hmm. or else and it's like not necessarily some people do really well in music or some people do really well in art or some people do really well in history um, it just we all have our own perspective and experience. And I think that's something that, I don't know that it's better with an only child. I certainly don't think um, then it's just different than having siblings. Yeah, I think just different is, is a great way to put it, right? Because we're all just, um, trying to under, understand ourselves, learn and, and meet our needs, you know? So if, if part of your needs are other siblings are involved, that's just part of the environment. And if they're not, they're not, you know what I mean? And I think too, that, that perspective um, for a child, having their perspective 
taken seriously mm -hmm. is instead of just you don't understand this because you are whatever age you are. You know, you're too little, you didn't learn this yet, you don't know enough. Taking their yeah. perspective seriously from the get-go, even if they're con per totally convinced that the grass is purple. <laughs> uh, you know, take it seriously and, and saying, hmm, well, I see it this way. Why do you, you know, how do you see it that way? Um, it starts them out being able to see other people's perspectives a little bit more than if they've had to, you know, elbow to maintain their space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Yeah, and it's just, it, that's just something we're em embracing as parents and we're choosing to give our children that space and that voice, right? By yeah. choosing this yeah. lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? Okay, well, I must say thank you so much for uh, taking the time to speak with me, both of you, and for <laughs> living through the tech issues as we figured this out. <laughs> <laughs> and before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Yeah? Um, Facebook, um, but I will let you know that evenings and weekends, I'm usually not online at all because I've got, I, I do software testing, so I've got my computers open all day, every day. And yes, it is plural computers. Um, and so when I leave work, I kind of leave technology behind as much as I can. <laughs> Wonderful. And you, Pat? I'm on Facebook a lot. I also host Heal Thyself on Facebook about um, natural health and healing. But if, I'm probably on a bunch of the different groups on yeah. unschooling, but we kind of do that pretty naturally without the groups now. And <laughs> I'll definitely there's put a less politics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll put a link to your Heal Lace Up group as well because I, I love that group. That's great. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Have a great evening. You too. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the second book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Live, Create a Thriving Unschooling Home. In it, I dive into the four characteristics that I found helped unschooling flourish in our home. Curiosity, patience, strong relationships, and trust. One reviewer wrote, Really enjoyed this short and sweet book. It has marvelous one-liners, and though I'm not an underliner, I found myself underlining on every page. Another said, I believe it would benefit any homeschooler or parent to read this book as it re-emphasizes the importance of the relationship between a parent and a child in the learning process. I plan to reread this book. It is rich and full of gems. Give yourself some time to absorb it before rushing into unschooling. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.